Hello everyone and welcome to this video which is in our Re-Engineering the Chess Classic series. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are taking a look at a game of one of our heroes, Richard Teichmann, but actually he is losing this game. This is from the match um, William Abert Napier against uh, Richard Teichmann. Richard Teichmann won it uh, plus five, minus one equals five. But um, I thought that the, um, the game Teichmann lost as black here uh, was quite interesting, um, both from the game point of view, um, certain episodes at least, and also um, from the engine point of view about what the engines were finding. It's in a Queen's Gambit declined Carlsbad structure, one that um, ooh, had a, a, had a look uh, in my time at this quite a few times in different books, Chess for Life, and also um, in Game Changer as well. Um, and uh, yeah, you always keep on finding interesting things. In particular, always interested in how aggressively the engines play this as black. So let's have a look at how this game proceeded. What I will do, it's quite a long game, so I'll, uh, I'll have some bits which I just uh, whiz through a bit more and other bits which are more interesting and I'll uh, uh, have a stop and think and have a look at what the engines thought as well. So this was uh, a Queen's Gambit declined. Bishop g5, knight bd7, and c6. Teichmann always played it in the good old-fashioned classical way, not um, any sort of Tartakova or Alaska systems, but um, just the good old way. And, um, well, Napier here took on uh, d5, setting up the, the Carlsbad structure, which is uh, basically 5 and 2 against 4 and... Th against, uh, well, 3 and 4. Um, and, um, yeah, one of White's major plans here um, is to play the minority attack. Minority attack, it's called that because you've got fewer pawns on the queen side than black, but still you launch an attack with your own pawns. And, um, yeah, the idea of this uh, is simply to weaken the black pawn structure, give yourself a target on the C file, and then hopefully win both those pawns in the long run. Um, yeah, pretty famous uh, plan, and, um, um, yeah, you know, scored fairly well in uh, in human chess over the years nowadays uh, you know we know a lot more about how to uh, to deal with it but still you know a very decent plan so bishop b7 bishop d3 castles queen c2 rook e8 castles and knight f8 this is the the good old fashioned classical way of uh, of playing it quite similar to the rai lopez in a way isn't it i mean the the knights coming over here and um, yeah you know all sorts of ways that you can do things so one idea is to to play this maneuver g6 and then knight e6 to g7 and then just get the exchange of, uh, of light squared bishops um, from black. In principle exchange of light squared bishops is not too bad for black because uh, the pawns are on the uh, are on light squares. Um, the one slight drawback to it is that um, yeah if white does manage to get some minority attack and take on c6 then you've lost your, um, your, your best <laughs> defensive piece for covering those pawns. Um, other ways of playing uh, stuff like going um, knight to g6, bishop to d6, and then h6. That's a, a plan that Keres liked a lot, uh, just to try and get the, the bishop pair like that, which is also quite uh, quite interesting. Lots of possibilities. Um, Napier played the move knight e5, which is, I'm sure, very much influenced by Pillsbury. Uh, just trying to set up the Pillsbury attack with, um, with f4, and then you go rook f3, and then you try and uh, make some massive attack on the king side. But in this uh, concrete position, there is a good response, and uh, Teichmann uh, played it, and that's knight g4. So bishop takes c7, queen takes c7, and the key point is that uh, f4 isn't possible because of knight takes c3. So um, basically, yeah, I mean, uh, white hasn't got much better either of retreating this knight or exchanging off the knight. The engines seem to prefer, prefer knight f3, but uh, knight g4 is much more natural. Bishop g4. And now Napier played um, rook e1. Um, what does uh, rook e1 do? Well, one of White's ideas obviously might be to play e4. Although, um, well, if you've seen the game um, uh, Marshall against Teichmann uh, earlier in this series, then um, you'll know that, um, well, black can even give away lots of tempi and play this structure. And it's not really that dangerous for black unless you've got something really immediate happening. Um, strangely enough, a much more common plan for White is to play the move f4. Hence the need to defend uh, e3. And then you just try and gain space with, uh, with f5. I mean, if obviously the bishop can uh, retreat, maybe black can play f6 and bishop h5 to f7. And then you just try and launch your g and h uh, pawns forward. Um, yeah, I mean, black tries in advance the, the, the queen side pawns. You know, it gets uh, quite sharp. But uh, this is uh, quite a common, uh, a common idea. 
Um, so I think that's what um, what Napier was um, was was aiming for. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the next move from um, from Teichmann is a little bit mysterious. I mean, I think what you notice in this game is that in this position as black, Teichmann was really struggling. I think to to find a, a plan. Um, he plays a lot, uh, plays around a lot with his pieces, um, but doesn't really get. You know, doesn't really make any improvements to the position. He moves them one way, then moves them another, and uh, well, in the end, you know, Napier just um, uh, just gets um, a massive advantage. In actual fact, um, yeah, I mean, one 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 line that uh, Dragon played was the move Bishop H5, looking for Bishop G6 actually. So White plays F4 to meet Bishop G6 with uh, with F5, and then F6 from um, from uh, Dragon just to be able to get the Bishop back to F7. And then king h1, a6, queen f2, bishop f7, and then the pawns start uh, start rolling here. Um, c5, knight d7, h5. A pretty sharp position. I mean, you know, this is obviously uh, coming in. It's going to be quite uh, quite dangerous as well. But, well, white's got play as well. So, interesting position, actually. Would just be a very interesting position to, uh, to play just in general. Um, what Teichmann did, Teichmann played the move queen f6 and um, the idea actually I think is to play rook e7 and rook e8 and maybe prevent white from playing this plan f4. Um, but what um, <coughs> Napier then did was uh, switch to the other side and played the move uh, a4. a4 is a little bit weird, I mean um, b4 would normally be the way that you uh, do it because uh, after a4 well, um, you know, you could just go a5, which I suggested, and uh, it's not an engine main move, but when you put it on there, the engines are, you know, are quite happy. Um, it's um, also uh, Stockfish was looking at queen d6, a bit odd, of course, to play queen f6 to d6, but to stop, um, uh, oops, sorry, to stop uh, b4 as well, um, and then to do the same plan of, uh, of bishop h5, you know, all sorts of possible. Uh, Teichmann played rook e7, Napier played b4, rook e8, and then the move um, b5. Um, now, just going to show you one um, one line that um, uh, that the engines gave because I think it start, it starts to give you a flavour of you know what do the engines actually aim for in these positions. And um, um, b5 obviously very natural, but uh, h3 was what um, uh, the engines wanted here. Bishop d7, and now knight e2 to either bring the knight round to f4 to g3. So, you know, Stockfish looking to shield the king's side. Funnily enough, this is also what uh, the type of plan that Stockfish 8 played against um, uh, Alpha Zero, you know, uh, back in the day. Um, but what is uh, what are the engines um, uh, looking for here? This is Stockfish against Dragon. Well, Dragon plays the move Knight G6, King H2, just to defend some stuff, and then just this move Knight H4, giving away the pawn on H7. So Stockfish grabbed it, and after Bishop D3, G5. And um, yeah, knight g1 played by uh, by um, a Stockfish, a, bit, a little bit all hands on uh, on deck. Queen d2, and then rook h8. And um, you know, not to get particularly into specific moves, but you get the the idea of the sheer aggression that the engines have. I mean, um, they're not just sitting around waiting for White to complete his plan and get some advantage on the queen side. They're also looking for the king side, sacrificing a pawn to open the h file. G5, looking for g4. Really aggressive play, and uh, that's something that I think you know human players still are a little bit um, slow, reluctant to do in these types of positions. And uh, certainly in the classical era, you know, they were not um, at all playing uh, playing plans like this. So um, b5 played by Napier, pretty uh, natural. Um, and now queen d6 from uh, Teichmann. And again, this is sort of playing around without that much purpose really and again let's have a look at what the engines want knight g6 h3 bishop d7 knight e2 knight h4 again giving uh, black this you know giving white this pawn if he wants but king h2 played and now a couple of ideas um queen d6 king h1 queen f6 was played by um who was this played by this looks like uh, um, stockfish to me yes it's stockfish uh, threatening stuff like bishop h3 followed by queen f3 check so knight g1, rook c8, just uh, targeting the queen there. g6, rook e8, obviously not too happy with the rooks as they were, but now h5, and then g5. You know, the, we, we're, getting, um, we're getting our stuff moving here. You know, rook b1, c5 as a sack, and then g4. You know, just um, 
just trying to get some um, some big activity going here, you know. And uh, I think the point of c5 will obviously be weakening the centre. You've also got stuff like bishop c6 and d4 attacking g2. Um, so that was uh, one thing. Um, in another game, I guess this was dragon. Uh, g5 happened straight away. Knight g1, rook c8 again, coming on the file, and then bishop f5. Um, and then, you know, we, we're going to look for, again, h5 and g4. But I, I think, you know, that the key thing is, you know, without getting into specific moves, it's the aggression that uh, the black has on the king side. There's not that many pieces, um, uh, you know, defending it for white. Um, there's no point in playing around with the pieces against the, the, uh, the white king side. You know, get the pawns involved. That's what the, uh, the engines are doing. And this was very much what Alpha Zero did against uh, Stockfish 8. And... You know, kind of the, the slightly revolutionary uh, uh, way that uh, Alpha Zero played it at the time and uh, scored quite nicely with black in those uh, sort of structures. But, uh, well, Teichmann played Queen d6 and, uh, well, we're not going to spend too much time looking at it because really Teichmann just plays around without very much purpose here. Um, just goes backwards, really. Bishop c8, rook c1. Plays the rook to e6. Napier brings the uh, the knight round to the king side to cover, stockfish style, if only he knew. Um, knight d7, queen c3, queen c7, rook b2. Um, yeah, I mean, Napier's just playing very calmly, and now Teichmann decides, oh, my, my rook's not doing anything at all, is it, in the king side, so he brings it back. But obviously, you know, a lot of time has been wasted. Queen d4, nice creeping moves from Napier. Now, he was actually a good player, uh, Napier, you know, it's... Uh, um, just um, a little bit uh, up and down and uh, Teichmann was too solid for him but uh, um, could play very nice games as well um, knight e2 so uh, the knight being re regrouped it's done its business on uh, the king side you know sort of protected it against um, any attack from black and now he's uh, coming round um, was threatening knight takes d5 there as well as knight takes e6 so the rook protects it and then bishop e2 and I think um, yeah either looking for bishop f3 or maybe Knight d3 and then eventually uh, knight e5, knight c5. So knight f6, bishop went back to d3. Um, yeah, presumably just uh, wanted to stop black from playing uh, to e4. Um, nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's just um, a little bit of, um, of uh, playing around. Yeah, the engines wanted g5 followed by h5. I mean, they still want to, um, you know, to, to go for it. h4, very much an alpha zero style move. You fix the h3 pawn so that g4 comes in later. Um, but that again is what the engines wanted I think Teichmann was sort of looking for that but after h5 I think Napier played a good move here Knight h4 just uh, stopping this king side also fixing these pawns on light squares same colour as the, the black uh, light squared bishop there very nice for the ending Knight g4, rook bc2 yeah, g3 seems more natural to me just uh, solidify everything but uh, well he did that later as well Knight g8, knight e7, yeah, I mean, Teichmann really doesn't know what to do here, but that's been the case for quite a few moves. <clears throat> so rook b2 now from uh, from uh, Napier, just grabbing the b-file. This is actually quite good play, you know, I mean, um, um, you can sort of uh, say, you know, oh, Napier hasn't been that uh, accurate, he could have played much quicker, but, you know, he, he's done absolutely nothing wrong. At the right moment, he sort of covered the, the, the king side with his knight, regrouped the knight, blocked uh, king side advance he's you know he hasn't done much wrong really he's just uh, been a, a little bit slow at times and here well Teichmann decided to swap off the rooks but yeah this is very very difficult indeed rook a8 now attacking the pawn on a7 rook d7 bishop f1 very nice move from uh, from Napier um, this bishop's coming round to h3 to attack this guy and we're also going to play the knight round either to d3 to c5 or e5 quite nice uh, maneuvers there Rook g8, protecting the rook so that you can exchange off the rooks. But one goes away and the other takes its place. And now he played the move that uh, the engine's been wanting to do for quite a long time, a6. It gives you uh, rook b7. Um, well, bishop c8 was played um, here by um, uh, Napier. Actually, uh, in all fairness, uh, rook b7 is actually uh, still a very strong uh, idea here. You've really got to watch out because uh, um, obviously bishop b7, I go a b7. Um, and then I'm just threatening queen. You can't stop it with the rook. So, well, here you might have to go knight d7 and uh, do it like that, which might be a little bit irritating for white because this uh, past a pawn is annoying. But it's definitely a tactic to uh, to remember for white. But Napier played it very nicely. Uh, f3, knight e8, and then e4. 
Uh, now the engines desperately want to create some counterplay, taking and playing something like f6, for example. But I mean, it's still pretty pretty unpleasant. We still go e5, uh, bring the bishop into c4, and then the king into e3. That's going to be pretty good. But um, well, um, Tyson played uh, king f8, and then uh, e5 here. Um, rook b7 was also uh, a move that the engine liked. You know, completely tying up absolutely everything there. That's also pretty good. But um, e5 is a very nice move. Stops the knight coming to d6. And um, after king e7, uh, Napier revealed his idea, which was to go bishop e2 and achieve g4. And either play g takes h5 and create a weakened h5 pawn that you can attack. Or if hg, fg, and then you've got a passed h pawn. The only thing I would say about this position, and this is something that the engines want, is that playing king f2, this is Stockfish's move, uh, would be very, very sensible. Because it just means that you can always... You know, protect the d4 pawn with the um, um, with the king. And um, well, in all fairness, there can't be a rush. You can't be in any sort of rush here. You know, um, uh, this must be you know very very good for um, for uh, for White. You know, without needing to play super super fast. So yeah, you know, why not activate the king? Um, I mean, uh, uh, I think this was this uh, this was also another move that uh, the engines wanted to play. Was this dragon? I think this was dragon. Knight g7, king f2. So I mean, um, with bishop d3, you're sort of uh, sort of dissuading black from playing uh, f6 because the g6 pawn is weak. And if knight e6, you just go king e3, you know, and um, knight c5. I go d takes c5. I can bring my king into d4. Everything's paralyzed, and then we'll uh, you know we'll find a way to push g4. Um, that would really be the most sensible. What 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 Napier does? It, it's a good mover. Uh, he's going bishop e2 and getting g4 in quickly. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a game in um, in um, uh, re-engineering the chess classics, quite appropriate for uh, for this type of video, um, which is actually a very famous game, Reshevsky against Petrojan, the famous one where Petrojan played rook e6 and sacrificed the exchange. And um, well, I, th I think we found some things that nobody's ever even thought of uh, before you know obviously thanks to the engines as well and um, you know what you noticed in that game was that what um, Ryshevsky did was absolutely correct in many ways uh, it's um, there was nothing wrong the engines were still saying you know one move before uh, he allowed this rookie six move um, that uh, that uh, Ryshevsky had a winning advantage but you know what he did uh, the way that he was playing, it contained the sort of the seeds for later disaster because he was actually, you know, unbeknown to him, taking some sort of strategical risks. And uh, when he just missed, you know, one idea or just, um, you know, played a little bit too slowly just at one crucial point, Petrojan had his idea and so suddenly everything was saved. He could have played in a much safer strategical way and got, you know, a, a big advantage in that way as well. And uh, a mistake would have would have cost a, a little bit less. And that's what I feel about this move. If you bring your king into uh, into the center like this, first of all, any later mistake that you make is going to be a lot less crucial because your king's well placed. So you've always got something to plug some hole somewhere. The way that Napier does with this very quick g4, leaving the king at home. Well, what you're going to see is that when he makes one misstep, um, well, suddenly this king is too far away to uh, restrict the opponent's king. Um, so Teichmann took on g4 and played knight e6. And of course, you don't have king e3 defending the pawn on uh, d4. So what you'd actually need is just a little bit of tactics. You'd need to play this move h5. And uh, well, if takes takes knight d4, we go bishop d1. And well, we're just going to keep on going with the old, uh, with the old pawn there. Um, and um, yeah, if you go king f8 to try and stop it, then I've just got bishop g4, which is uh, winning a piece there. And of course, I've always got moves like um, uh, rook b7 coming in as well to also win a piece. So something like that was necessary. Well, he took on, on e6, king e6. And now, again, the move bishop d3 was very important here. And after c5, then you go h5. And again, you know, it's uh, um, this is going to be... You know, just killing basically because, uh, well, you, you just can't stop this uh, this pawn from queening without losing material for uh, for black. But what um, Napier did again was was play the move h5, and uh, you know, very very consistent, of course, absolutely. But yeah, there has been some positional risk involved, namely because this king is passive. And amazingly, now after the move king f5, um, Stockfish is saying that the position is a draw. Um, and again, it's it's really really 
weird how this happened and this has happened to me you know uh, as well whilst uh, whilst playing what I thought were really nice grinds and all of a sudden you end up and you think but actually am I better anymore even and uh, it's just that you know you, you set up this this big bind on the opponent's position and you you know you play moves like a6 squeezing like that and you say I've got him completely under control but then you you know you change the situation slightly and suddenly you know all the control goes and uh, this 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 squeeze here suddenly it, it's it's a pawn that can be a, it, that's being attacked rather than something that's really you know restricting the opponent because the opponent's got free the king's free the rook's going to get free and and this pawn suddenly is a lot less important uh, the things can change very quickly in um, in endings you know um uh, just according to the pawn structure according to the squares that you're taking away from the opponent's pieces you know even more quickly i feel than in uh, than in middle games and um yeah this is a case in point you know from from uh, having uh, just been better all the way and having controlled uh, Teichmann quite beautifully, now all of a sudden, um, yeah, Napier finds that he's not better anymore. So um, uh, King F2 was played and now C5 takes Rook takes, or takes D4 rather, yeah. Um, Rook takes C5, Rook B7 is really, really annoying. That was the uh, uh, thing. I'm attacking A7 and B and uh, F7. It's a sort of a shortcut for attacking the pawn. And if you take, I take and you can't get to B5. So B8 Queen will uh, will win. That's a very nice uh, little trick. So D4 was played by uh, Teichmann. Just um, waiting a little bit. I mean, he might take the pawn on E5. He might go Rook takes C5 later. Um, in actual fact, rook takes c5 is going to be a threat because after rook b7, well, I don't know, it's not going to be a threat yet, but maybe you'll get rook c5, rook takes c5 and be able to come back to, uh, to e8 later. So rook b1 was played by, um, uh, by Napier. I'm sure not what he wanted to do, but um, if you go rook a8, I just take on e5 here and I'm, you know, I'm still well within the reach of this h pawn. So, um, uh, yeah what um uh what um Napier did was play rook b1 just trying to get actually behind this pawn and, and push this one through king e5 h6 and now bishop f5 so covering the pawn on the the h7 square and attacking the rook on b1 now the idea then was to go rook b7 so we've dragged the bishop away so we're attacking here but well yeah it's just one pass pawn here and in the meantime Black has also got a pass pawn, and uh, well, that's what um, that's what Teichmann went for. Now, I'm actually quite intrigued. I think that Teichmann was actually started playing for a win in uh, in this position because uh, there are there, along the way you'll see there are countless ways to draw. For example, Rook C2, King E1, Rook C1 is just a you know I don't think there's going to be anything more than a draw by repetition here. So um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, this is. Uh, there are plenty of ways to draw, but I think that, um, that uh, yeah, uh, uh, Teichmann started thinking very optimistically about getting a win here. So d3, bishop f3, and then king f4, just giving away this pawn on f7 and not um, looking anything, not trying to just restrain this pawn on a6. He's going for the, for the opponent's king. And now rook c2 check, king g1. And now I really wonder what happened here because uh, there are all sorts of draws. I mean, I can just keep on giving checks. That's, uh, you know, an absolute draw there. Um, I could also, in this position, just, uh, you know, uh, take on f3 here. Rook f5 and then, well, do what I want really. King e4, h7, rook c8. And, uh, you know, I've got d2 and you've got these past pawns here. So, uh, well, we'll just keep on... Uh, checking the king until it goes uh, until it goes in front of the um uh, until it goes in front of the pawn you know it's not so uh, not so um not so bad really we'll always be able to to uh, to queen one of these pawns if uh, the rook has to be given up for the d pawn so th there are plenty of draws of which you know rook c1 check with perpetual is the simplest but in this position Teichmann played the move king g3 um rook f5 rook c1 check and whether he missed Napier's next move, bishop d1, <laughs> which is the only move in actual fact, or whether he thought that maybe uh, the disposition was also going to be drawn and wouldn't give, would never, could it never ever be lost, it might also be the case. Because uh, I had to blink a few times before I realised what was happening here. So um, rook d2, um, uh, and it looks like, you know, black has got, um, has got uh, always going to have a perpetual with rook g2, rook h2. But Napier went rook a1 and uh, rook g2 check was played and now king f1. And I sort of wondered, 
I sort of assumed that um, uh, that rook h2 was going to be uh, absolutely fine for black just when I was you know playing through it quickly because we're threatening rook h1 mate and you know king e1 we're going to lose our um, we're going to lose our rook aren't we but unfortunately after rook h1 king takes rook a1 h7 there's no way you can stop both pawns when you go rook h1 I go a7 so uh, you're just going to end up with queen against rook here there's nothing you can do about it really quite uh, quite nasty if Teichman missed that then I'm quite a quite uh, quite sad for him really because uh, you know that was uh, that would, would have been quite nice I mean he went uh, d2 and then rook a3 check and um, well king h2 looks really great you think you're going to play rook g1 and d1 queen but here rook d3 is just uh, completely winning and again yeah uh, you just can't you just can't do anything and uh, we're just going to push one of those two pawns to uh, to queen so we take king f4, but now rook d3 again, king e4, rook d7, and well, that's just curtains. Um, uh, a7 is happening, or h7, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. So rook g6 was played, a7, and uh, uh, Teichmann resigned this eventful game. There we are. It wasn't a perfect game by any ways, by any means, maybe not particularly distinguished, but I thought there were you know, a lot of, uh, of interesting points there. First of all, you know this this whole queen's gambit declined um, um, uh, structure, and also you know it shows why it's flexibility. You could aim for an advance on the king side with f4 to f5, but uh, when that got uh, a little bit restrained, then Napier just went on the queen side. I thought it was very interesting how the engines you know play so aggressively on the king side. They don't just give White a free hand on the queen side. They really you know try and develop something on the king side, and uh, you know that's. In Game Changer, we've got a fantastic example of that, the Rook's Pawn Symphony. I think it's also on our on the Game Changer uh, YouTube site and also on the Chessable course for uh, for Game Changer as well. You know, it's simply such a powerful way of playing. Um, it's um, but yeah, you know, Teichmann really struggled just um, just playing around with the pieces, and I thought that Napier played uh, played some nice chess at times. You know, just um, just going forwards in a nice uh, unhurried way. Uh, just creeping forwards with the pieces, keeping control. Um, and uh, yeah, until we got to this uh, this very interesting moment, you know, um, a very typical moment when, when you're grinding like that, that you, um, you know, your whole position makes sense until you suddenly, um, you know, give the opponent a move that, uh, that allows him to free his pieces just a little bit. And then there's like a complete turnaround. And this went from totally winning to um, to just a draw I mean certainly involving all your pieces in an ending you know having had the king on to e3 for example or restricting the opponent's pieces with bishop d3 before you press h5 you know very good end game technique and yeah you know just um, yeah really what you uh, really what you need there I mean just point out another point that after bishop d3 c5 if I go h5 takes I've got the move bishop f5 picking up the piece which is uh, also very very powerful as well so um, yeah, and then the the sudden turnaround. I think uh, yeah, Teichmann very optimistic. I think he already had a big lead in the match, so uh, I think he was uh, definitely playing for the win. Which you know, I, I mean, uh, I think shows the type of player Teichmann was. You know, he was quite quiet and you know disciplined and uh, and solid. But um, yeah, he wasn't a coward or anything. You know, he was uh, um, quite capable of uh, just uh, you know playing on and on for uh, for a win like that. And. Uh, and not necessarily his reputation, actually. He had the reputation of somebody quite, uh, you know, um, yeah, you know, um, easygoing and, uh, and happy to take draws. But not really, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe not as fanatic as an Alakin or Alaska or someone like that. But, well, not everyone is somehow, you know. It's, uh, I thought he was, um, you know, looking at his games, it seems like a pretty, uh, yeah, you know, pretty uh, aggressive and, uh, and uh, player with a, a good amount of fighting spirit. And uh, yeah, very uh, very funny end to it somehow. This uh, um, this uh, little tactic here with uh, Bishop D1, and uh, yeah, somehow this rook ending is is not drawn. It's uh, a little bit of a surprise to me. I did sort of assume with uh, the, the pieces that active for Black that uh, it shouldn't be impossible. But uh, yeah, these two pawns impossible to stop for a lone rook once they're uh, once they're passed. So there we are. Hope you enjoyed that. Just um, I'm, I'm getting towards the end of my uh, Teichmann games. Got a few more uh, interesting little ones, but uh, um, getting towards the uh, the end of it now. Thank goodness there's uh, plenty of stuff at the TCC. Uh, we've got a super final playoff and also the super final to look forward to. And of course, there's the uh, the chess.com um, uh, 
rapid uh, main event there um, where with uh, Leela Stockfish and of course Torch the new engine playing which is you know really really interesting so um, uh, glad to follow that and uh, well maybe there'll be uh, maybe I'll come across some some other some other old player that I want to share a few games uh, with as well so um, there we are if you like the uh, video please give a like subscribe to the channel tell your friends take a look at my new book re-engineering the chess classics really full of great stuff like this and otherwise thanks very much for watching and see you at the next video thanks for watching